very first letter that Paul wrote, other people think, no, maybe Galatians was, but for sure, 1 Thessalonians is the first individual church letter that writes. And when we look at 1 Thessalonians in just a minute, um, you're going to see, and I'm going to ask you to look more on your own throughout this week, that Paul writes about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and he says, we're telling you something by revelation. And you know, for us, this is, uh, as you, if you'll look down at the bottom of the, um, uh, if you look at some, uh, some of what I say here, Paul writes about the second coming. And you know, we have read it so many times and we've heard so many messages that it's old hat to us. It's nothing exciting to us. But imagine for these Thessalonian believers, brand new believers, hearing something for the very first time. No other Christians had heard this before. No other Christians uh, knew about these details of the second coming of Jesus. But Paul says, I got it from revel I got a revelation from God himself about this. And the Thessalonians are the first to hear it. So there's some firsts there. Um, what comes after this, when you look ahead, the next section will be Berea. Very, very short also, but this morning we're looking at Thessalonians. And then I give you some things for further study because there's so much here, um, especially in 1 Thessalonians, that we're not going to have time to look at this morning. I really struggled in preparation this week because as I was reading in Acts and then looking in 1 Thessalonians, oh, I, I said, oh, I, I want to talk about this and I want to talk, talk about that. But honestly, one of my prayers as, a, as, your, as one of your pastors has been, Lord, help me to, uh, help me to cut it down. Help me to, to uh, uh, simplify. And I've really been praying that. So you pray that for me too. Because um, my impulse, my personal impulse is never to simplify. My personal impulse is, oh, look at this and look at this and look at this. Um, so I really encourage you to, on your own, after the message this morning, go back and read 1 Thessalonians. Um, and I promise you, you will be blessed. So there's some things there. And then if you want to, you can turn over to the back side uh, because that's where we will, that's where we're going to uh, go this morning as we, um, as we begin the message. Let me turn some things around. I've got, I've got that there. And so we, as we look this morning, good news to the Thessalonians, the message in word and power. Lord, we pray that this message also will be not only in word, but in your power. And we ask God that you would open our hearts and that um, as our hearts are open to you, as we choose to open our hearts to you, that your word will enter our hearts and our lives and we'll, we'll find a dwelling place there and that we will respond to you just as the Thessalonians did. Um, and your word did wonderful, as your word did wonderful things in their lives. May it also do wonderful things in our lives. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 So the last two weeks uh, that we looked at this, we were looking at Philippi. Um, probably most of us, Philippi is one of the most exciting parts uh, of Acts, of our study of Acts. You know, we meet Lydia. Uh, we meet uh, a demon-possessed slave girl. We meet the jailer. There's an earthquake. They're delivered from prison. Uh, it really is one of the most exciting passages of Acts. And in Philippi, there are great spiritual victories. And a vibrant and loving and a generous church is established in this wonderful city, um, as we know when we read uh, the letter to the Philippians later on. When, when Paul writes to them, he's in Rome and he's in prison. It's not right before he's executed, but he's in prison. And that's when he writes back to the Philippians about 10 or 11 years later. Um, and we know from reading Philippians that there's a great that there's a great church there. I hope the same could be said of Lighthouse. I believe it can, I believe it can be. In very different circumstances, these three people, there are many, many more, but in very different circumstances, these three people come to salvation. As I look at you this morning, as I look at Lighthouse, I, I wonder if we're a little bit like the Philippian church. Uh, some of you, when you came to the Lord, you may have been very successful and had seemingly had everything together as Lydia did, but you still needed Jesus. Some of you may have been in wretched, miserable conditions, just like that demon-possessed slave girl. Uh, some of you may have been in position of authority, like the, 
the Philippian jailer, and you learn that there is a higher authority and a greater power. But we have all come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, each one of them, in very different circumstances, they have, been, uh, they have heard the message of the gospel and they are set free. They are Philippian citizens, and so they have a very treasured and precious citizenship, Roman citizen, citizenship, because they are part of this city. But Paul writes to them just a little bit later, and I just want to remind you of this, but we are citizens of heaven. It's, it's not by chance that Paul writes this to the Philippians. He knows what he's doing when he says that, uh, because he's writing to people who in the past have taken great pride in their Roman citizenship. And he says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we're eager, eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. They've been rescued from the king of, kingdom of darkness and they've brought into the kingdom of light just as we have. Let me ask you something this morning. In what do you take great pride in your life? Do you take great pride in your citizenship? Do you take great pride in your ethnicity? Do you take great pride in your brain power or, or, or in your pocketbook? Oh, beloved, may we take great pride in our citizenship of heaven and our salvation. Amen. And we're eagerly waiting, just as the Philippians did, a Savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to take us to our real home, the home for which we have been made, the home for which we are being prepared even now. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be wonderful. And so the work of God that he's doing in you, let him do it and cooperate with him. Why? He's getting you ready for your eternal home and your heavenly citizenship, which is not that far away. When I get to heaven, I want to be ready for heaven. When I get to heaven, I want to fit in. When I get to heaven, I want it to be a suitable place for me to live. Don't you? Yeah. I hope so. Amen. Amen. And the Lord is preparing us now. And so Paul writes that to the Philippians. So we leave Philippi. There were great spiritual victories there. But wherever there are great spiritual victories, and you can look at your notes as we're going along, wherever there are great spiritual victories, almost always... Great spiritual victories come at great spiritual cost. They really do. In, in our life in Christ, in our spiritual lives, nothing comes cheaply. Someone pays a price for it. Jesus paid the price, the greatest price of all. But do you know for each one of us a price has been paid for the victories that we have in our lives? If you have come to salvation, I can tell you somebody somewhere has prayed. Somebody somewhere has prayed. You may not even, you may not even know the person. The person may not even know you, but they were praying for people. The Spirit led them to pray. And I want to encourage you this morning because we look at Philippi as we're turning to Thessalonica this morning. These great spiritual victories. And there were more than these three people, but these are the three that are highlighted. But Paul and Silas paid a great cost for these great spiritual victories. And opposition arises. They're thrown into prison. They're beaten severely and they're thrown into prison. Their name is defamed um, in, the, in the city. And then we know the rest of the story, um, but their spirits are not imprisoned. And in the midnight hours, they pray and they sing hymns of praise to the Lord. And the God of the universe, who can use anything, uses an earthquake, to release them from their chains, to release them from their stocks, to release them from their prison. And um, he brings great triumph out of that. And out of that, the jailer also comes to the Lord. But great spiritual victories require great spiritual sacrifice as well and great spiritual cost. Anything, anything in our lives, those of us who are Christians now, may I say to you, if there are things in your life that you want to move ahead in spiritually, if there are areas of your life where you feel like I'm still in bondage or I'm still moving slowly in this area, I urge you and I encourage you to get serious with God, if you haven't been serious with God, and pay the price spiritually to receive the victory that you need in your life, in your family, in your situation.
it's worth it. The enemy never gives up easily what has been his. The enemy never gives up easily ground that he has, but he will give it up in the power of God. And that's why Paul writes to the Ephesians, stand fast in the mighty power of God. And in everything he gives you, use every tool that God gives you to stand against the enemy and to fight against the enemy. We cannot use our own tools. We have to use what God gives us because it's a spiritual battle, right? It's a spiritual battle and it will be won spiritually. Amen. We see that with Paul and Silas. And so we know the events that follow. Uh, they get out of prison. They uh, go to the new, they go back to Lydia's and they, they meet with the believers, they encourage them once more. Hey, I want, have you thought about this before? You know, I don't know about you, but I always think of Paul as, he's kind of like one of the Avengers. You know, if, if you've seen, if you've seen, I know most of you have seen some of the Avenger movies, right? Those of you that haven't, uh, sorry. It's a pop culture reference. But you know, they're, they're sort of superheroes, right? They get whacked and they get right back up and boom, 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 you know? Uh, they arrow, uh, uh, um, uh, bullets bounce off of them. They fly into the air with the greatest of ease. And, and you know, I, I think we get used to thinking of some of these uh, of people like Paul as sort of superheroes, right? We really do. It's like, oh, they just jump out of prison and they keep on going. But I want you to think with me what what Paul and Silas must have looked like and what they must have been feeling as they went back to the home of Lydia that early that morning to encourage all of these Christians who were there. Paul and Silas had been severely beaten. We have no record that the Holy Spirit supernaturally healed their wounds and uh, gave them this great strength to overcome what had just happened to them. I imagine Paul and Silas were limping I imagine Paul and Silas probably didn't even want to wear the clothes that were on their back because of the, the terrible wounds um, and because of the terrible stripes and the things that, had, that, had, that they had endured. I can imagine as they go back to the church, can you imagine, I'm sure their faces were bloodied and bruised and they were all banged up and they come back to the church and they encouraged them. <laughs> they didn't look very much like superheroes, did they? <laughs> Oh, brothers and sisters, don't let the, the world's idea of superheroes um, influence what we see in the Word of God. Paul was a real person. He bled. He bruised. He ached. I imagine he groaned some as well. And so, so, did, so did Silas. So did Silas. Nevertheless, in their condition, in their condition, they encourage the saints. I want to tell you something. It is not always from the mountaintop that we hear and receive the greatest encouragement. It is sometimes somebody who is walking through a valley who proves, my God is faithful and he never leaves me, never forsakes me. Amen. Don't think that just because you're going through a tough time, you have nothing to say to bring glory to God. It is often in the hardest times that what we say brings the greatest glory and the greatest honor to our Lord. Amen. 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 And so Paul and Silas meet, and then they encourage, and then they left town. Uh, and then they keep on traveling. They s travel through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. Um, so they, they arrive, and I want to, let's just real quickly, let's look, just look at some of the maps. So they were up here. They were in Philippi. And then they go southwest. They pass through some smaller towns there, and they make it to Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica was about a hundred miles, or that's about 160 kilometers, I think, roughly, um, from Philippi. And I want you to think of this. It would have taken them, from what we read in the Bible, probably about three days. So if they were bruised and bloody and broken, they couldn't have traveled 30 miles a day. No, there's just no way. They couldn't have, and it would have been overland. So probably the believers in Philippi provided um, carriages or horses or something like that, prob probably animals in some way to help them get to Philippi. We already know that the Philippian church was extremely generous and was a partner with Paul and Silas and the team in, uh, uh, in their missions and in their, and in their ministry. 
And so they make it there. They make it to Thessalonica. And at that time, Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia. It's what we call Greece today. Okay? So Thessalonica down here, not Philippi, but Thessalonica was the capital. And later it was, it was the capital of all of the Greek provinces. It was a huge city. Even at that time, a city of 200,000. Now here we are in Hong Kong, a city of uh, about 8 million, right? I think Hong Kong's about 8 million. So 200,000 sounds like peanuts um, to most of us, but where I'm from, a city of, within the city limits, 200 people, 200,000 sounds pretty big to me. Um, and at that time, it would have been a very large city. And like Philippi, it was a free city. It was self-governing. Um, and that was a great privilege, and it was a great honor. But unlike Philippi, it was not a military city. Remember, Philippi was a military city with a big fort, and there were many retired military officials and their families in Philippi. That's why there wasn't a large Jewish population in a military city, and so there was no synagogue. But we come to Thessalonica, um, and... It's not a military city, but it's a city of great trade. When you look at where the location is, it was right on the coast, and it was also a hub of various trading routes. So it was a really rich city, and it was a commercial, and it was a, tr a trading hub. And because of this, it had a large Jewish population. And because of that, it also, of course, had a synagogue. So it's not surprising. And so they, as, as we read, they came to Thessalonica where there was uh, a Jewish population, a large, a large Jewish population and a synagogue. Do you know that Thessalonica is still there today? Have any of you ever vi visited Greece before? Um, I have. And uh, Thessalonica is still there. The name has changed a little bit. It's called Salonica or Thessaloniki today. And it's still there today. And it's home to the oldest Jewish population in all of main uh, uh, in all of the mainland of Europe even today so that's Thessalonica um, so Paul's evangelism strategy when he arrives in Thessalonica it's a little bit different from Philippi because there's a there is a, a synagogue so let's see what happens next um, so as was Paul's custom he went to the synagogue service now he goes to the synagogue service but Paul is a Christian right so why is, it, is he accepted in the synagogue? Paul was still considered a rabbi, and he had been trained by the great rabbi Gamaliel. So of course he was welcome, uh, he was welcome in this synagogue. And so he used the scriptures to reason with the people. Of course he did. Paul always started with where people were and where their understanding was. It's always a good place to start. When you're, when you're sharing with people um, about Jesus and you want to share with them about God, oh, don't start with something way out there that they don't understand or that has no relevance to them. Start with where people are. Start with what they know. Start with your own life. And that's what Paul does. He starts with the scriptures and he reasons with them. Paul was a great scholar. And he says, these prophecies that you know, they knew the prophecies. He said, the prophecies of the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah. He's come. And so he started with what they knew, and then he went on, and he introduced Jesus to them. They had not heard about Jesus before. And he says, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Now, who's his audience? Well, he's in the synagogue, so who's the first audience to which he's preaching? Jews, okay? Jews, of course. But Jews are not the only people in this synagogue. Who else is in the synagogue? There are Jews there, but there are also God-fearing Greek men. And then along with that, there would be a lot of prominent women that were attached. So this group is Jewish. And down here is this group that is Greek. Um, we've talked about this before, but the Greek and the Roman religions were so pagan. They were so idolatrous. They were so immoral that there were many who wanted nothing to do with the immorality. In fact, most of the Greek and Roman cults and religions had, um, had sexual immorality, had uh, holy prostitutes, both male and female, who were part of the religious worship of that. And, and it, that's hard for us to imagine, right? How can that be? But it was part of the culture, it was part of the religious practice. And so there were a lot of people who wanted nothing to do with that, and they were attracted by the, the teaching of Judaism. There's one God, and, and he, gave moral, he gave moral laws 
what they didn't like was the strong Jewish nature of it and all of the rituals that they had to do. Then along comes Paul, and he doesn't talk about being Jewish. He talks about Christ and the freedom that comes in Christ. So what's the response as we look at it? Some of the Jews were persuaded, but what happens? Along with many God-fearing Greek men and a quite a few prominent women. And so here's this response, more Greek than Jewish, but some Jews as well. Now in Philippi, the opposition came from the, the owners of the slave girl because they had lost their income. So economic reasons raised opposition, but in, Thessalon in Thessalonica, it's a little bit different. What happens in Thessalonica? Mm. The Jews get jealous. Now, ah, jealousy is so ugly, isn't it? It's so ugly. It's ugly, and it's especially ugly because it always hides itself, right? Have you ever been jealous? I hope I thought I think I heard one person say no. <laughs> Have you ever lied? Okay, just go ahead and say yes. We've all we've all been jealous. We have been all of us have been jealous. But let's be honest. When we have been jealous, we've always tried to hide it, right? We know it's ugly, don't we? And so we make it look like something else and we sound like something else, you know, because really they are blah, 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 blah. It's always, it's always the case. And that's what happens here. Now, before we judge them really, really harshly, I was thinking about this yesterday. Think about it this way. Um, we think, well, that's terrible. You know, they're jealous. And, but Paul and Silas are preaching the truth, and they were preaching the truth. Imagine if a little bit further down Hillwood Road, a new church starts a new church begins. Uh, by the way, that happened one time in the earlier years of Lighthouse, and the people who started it came and grabbed a bunch of people from Lighthouse and took them off um, to, to, to the new church. But let's just say a new church starts halfway down the block on Hillwood Road. New preacher, much more exciting than Pastor Renee and Pastor Jennifer. Maybe they're younger. <laughs> they're younger. Maybe they turn the lights down with worship and they really have this huge worship with some smoke and some, you know, all sorts of things. And so much more exciting than Stephen and Panina and Chris, right? You, you know, and they've really got like a full, they've got a full band and whatever. Sorry, Brother XP. Sorry, Ying and others or whatever. You know, they've got all this or whatever. And it's really exciting. And let's say that about a third of you thought, let's go see what that's like. <laughs> and off you go. How would we feel? <laughs> we might struggle with feelings of jealousy, right? <laughs> we might struggle. But in this case, um, it's really an ugly jealousy. But of course, jealousy always covers its face. And so they form a mob and they start a riot. By the way, the enemy, that's something I really see as I've, as I've gone through this. The enemy never fights fair, and the enemy never gives up easily what has been his. Never. He never gives up easily. Um, he always fights hard. Oh, may God help us also to fight hard for what is ours in the Lord and for what he has promised us. Right? Amen. Amen. And so they start a riot. That seems to be the... Uh, MO. That seems to be the modus operandi. Let's start a riot. Let's go get a mob. Let's go get some rough characters from the marketplace. Let's, uh, let's, start a, let's grab a mob and then they'll start a riot. And so they start a riot because when there's a riot, you know, you can do all sorts of things, right? Have you ever been near a riot before? Have you ever seen a riot before? Lawlessness. And so this riot starts and they're looking for Paul and Silas, but they can't find Paul and Silas. They go to the home of Jason, and now we meet Jason. Um, and you look in your notes, you can find out a little bit more about him. He's probably a Jewish convert, and probably the church meets in his home, because when they don't find Paul and Silas, they drag out Jason. I, I imagine he got some bruises also. And also some of the other believers. They were there, at the, there and they grab them and they take them. Um, to the before the city council just as they did for the magistrates okay and so they grab them and then I want you to see uh, what happens next they accuse them and look at what they accuse they're shouting and they say Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world and now they're here disturbing our city too mm. what an accusation but as you can see in your notes 
What a testimony, right? What a testimony. Wouldn't you like for your enemies to accuse you of being a troublemaker for Jesus? You're kind of snickering. You don't want trouble, right? <laughs> Paul and Silas faced trouble wherever they went. They were troublemakers for Jesus. Um, remember I told you, I can't, I can't, some of you may remember, and I don't remember which great uh, evangelist, what, was it, it, it may have been Spurgeon or it may have been Smith Wigglesworth, I can't remember, or maybe Andrew Murray who said, I want to be one of the ten most wanted men in hell. Remember that? I told you that uh, about a year or so ago. I'll have to look it up again. It, it was one of those, it was one of those great, or maybe it was, I think it was Spurgeon, and I expect Spurgeon was one of the ten most wanted in hell. I'm pretty sure Paul was at the top of the list at the time. Um, May we be high on the hit list, really. Praise the Lord. And so here's the testimony. They're troublemakers. They're troublemakers. Let me ask you. And then the second, uh, Jason gets, comes in for the accusation as well. And then he says, they're guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. Let me ask you something this morning. What is there about your life, whether you say it or whether you show it, that says to the world, you and I profess allegiance to another king and his name is Jesus. Or are our lives and our words so much like the, the people around us that there's really not much difference? We're not troublemakers for Jesus. We're, we're not causing trouble. We're going with the flow. We're just like everybody else. God help us to have a testimony slash accusation from those that oppose us that is something like this. Oh, may, may the accusation against us as Christians never be, they're kind of lazy. Well, they don't always tell the truth. Well, they should be whatever, but they are that. Oh, may that never be our testimony, brothers and sisters. May it be something, even if it causes trouble for us, May it be something that honors God in our life. May we be troublemakers for Jesus because we're going against the flow, because our lives are different from those around us. And, and by our very lives, whether we say a word or not, brings a, 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 a light and at times a rebuke to those who are living in darkness. It offers hope to those living in darkness and those who are who are who are, have lives full of the, the, work, of the, the work, work of the devil, that they see something different in our lives. What a testimony. Amen? What a testimony. Truly, truly. And so the accusation comes against us. That's a pretty great accusation, I think. Um, and we see what the official response is. It's jealousy, but those are pretty good. Those are pretty true words, actually. Now, you know, the Roman government didn't care what people believed. Did you know that? Oh, you can believe anything you want to. We don't care. But if you disrupt the public order, then there's trouble. And they come down with an iron hand. So what happens? Everybody, they were thrown into turmoil by the reports. And so the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond or to kind of almost like to give uh, to, to pay bail if you want to and then they release them every once in a while uh, when we see pictures on on television um, of riots and things like that it, it gives us I encourage you sometimes when you see it on the news although of course we are supposed to think of those things that are lovely and of good report <laughs> um, as, as as we have as we have been studying I encourage you every once in a while when you see something like that let your mind think about all that you read about riots and mobs in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, and it will give you, it will give us a little bit of a flavor of what, of what Paul and Silas were facing regularly in the cities. It's quite frightening. It's, it's, quite, it's quite scary. Anyhow, uh, they have to post bond, and then they release them. And so, uh, as we look at this, let's see what happens next. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. That's a city that's about 45 miles away. And as I was thinking about that, when we look just at these nine or ten 
verses, it's very anticlimactic, isn't it? Compared to, to Philippi and what happens in Philippi, it almost seems like the believers are a little bit scared. Okay, get out of town quick before there's any trouble. Maybe almost in fear. And they send them off quickly to Berea. We don't hear of any great victories. We don't hear anything about the church that has started. We only meet Jason and basically, we hardly even meet Jason. He just is, is arrested or, or he's dragged off before the city officials. And so we know very, very little um, about, about Thessalonica if this is where we stop. Um, and so as we come to this point, as we look at these 10 verses, this is where you and I have to become students of the Word of God. Don't just stop here. And because if we stop here, we won't really get a picture of what's going on in Thessalonica. Instead, we're going to dig a little bit deeper and we're going to go to the letter of 1 Thessalonians this morning. Um, you've heard me preach before from 1 Thessalonians and I've talked about it and I always used to say they were only in Thessalonica three weeks. Well, I did a little more digging and I have found out I was wrong. Um, they probably stayed in Thessalonica about six months. They preached in the synagogue for three weeks. But then, probably outside of that, they began to evangelize and they began to have teaching among the, uh, among the, among the other Christians. Why did they say six months? Because later on, if we did a little bit of digging as students of the Bible, later on, Philip says to the, uh, not Philip, Paul, I hope you caught that, right? I was preaching a false gospel to you. Paul says to the Philippians, you sent me help again and again when I was in Thessalonica. That's what he says. And then in 1 Thessalonians, Paul himself writes about working. He was working as a tent maker in Thessalonica to support himself. So there's no way these things could have happened if he was there for just such a short time. So as we, what we're going to do is we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians. So if you have your Bibles, paper Bibles, or your click clicks. You can turn there if you want to. And we're going to turn to 1 Thessalonians to find out a little bit more about what went on in Thessalonica while Paul and Silas were there. What are we going to find out about these Thessalonian believers? So let's turn there this morning. And I, I, want, to, I want to give you, you know I love maps, right? I love maps. <laughs> but I've tried to simplify. So they're in Thessalonica and then they go off to Berea. This is going to help us see when the letter to 1 Thessalonians was written. So they were there uh, to, to, the, to the Christians at Thessalonica when it was written. So they were there about six months. They leave for Berea, okay? So there they are. They go to Berea. They don't stay a long time there. And then they all go to Athens, okay? So it's quite a long way down to Athens. Athens is still there today. So the group is there, but when they all get to Athens, Paul is so concerned about the Christians and the church at Thessalonica, which was a young church and not fully taught, um, and he had to leave quickly before he was prepared to leave. Paul is so concerned uh, that he, take, he gets Timothy. Wow, young Timothy. And he gives Timothy the dangerous and important task of going back to Thessalonica. So the blue arrow is, the blue arrow is Timothy. Um, Paul is the red arrow. He stays in Athens for a while. He doesn't have a lot of success in Athens. Paul goes on to Corinth, and when he's in Corinth, Timothy comes back from Thessalonica, and in, in Corinth, Timothy comes back with a report about the church at Thessalonica. Paul hears the report and sits down and he writes the letter of 1 Thessalonians. Does that make sense? Yes. Or did I confuse you? No. Okay, we got it. So he writes from Corinth to the, to, uh, to the church in, in Thessalonica and he writes the letter. Here's what's great about reading 1 Thessalonians. The letter of 1 Thessalon Thessalonians is written only three to six months after he had been there. So it's a very, uh, it's very close to the time that he's here. So that gives us the background, okay? Did you know that before? No. Didn't know that, now you know it, okay? That's what comes when we're students of the Word of God. Okay, and so um, he writes the letter of 1 Thessalonians. What do we know? We know that the church is young. We know that the church is not fully trained. And we also know that the church is more Greek than Jew, 
and so they don't have a strong foundation in Old Testament scripture. So my question is, why is Paul so concerned about wanting to get back there, and why is he co so concerned about writing a letter? He writes a letter the, to them so quickly, he doesn't do this for any other church. So let's find out, because 1 Thessalonians tells us why. Paul writes the letter, and let's see what it says in this letter. We're going to look at just a few scriptures. He says in 1 Thessalonians, this is going to tell us why the letter was written, and this gets into what we're going to talk about for the rest of our time together this morning. Paul writes, So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit, in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. Well, Acts 17, 1 through 10 doesn't say anything about suffering and persecution, does it? It just says they were there and then Paul and Silas had to leave. But we find out in the letter that when the Thessalonians received the message that Paul and Silas gave them, severe suffering came upon them. How different from what it is these days, isn't it? These days, so many, from so many mouths and from so many preachers and from so many teachers, it is a prosperity gospel. It is a good news, feel good gospel that's just warm and fuzzy. It's so, so nice. Um, but that's not what happened here in Thessalonica, is it? Paul says you received the message, and when you received the message, it brought severe suffering to you. I wonder how many people today, upon receiving the message, message of Jesus, if they rece received severe suffering, would say, Yay, great, yes, it's for me. I'm not sure these days. But I want you to see something else also. Paul says, you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. Because Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Be joyful. I've overcome the world. One of the, one of the, the, the works of the Holy Spirit is to help you and me stand, help us keep going, help us to mature, and one of the other works of the Holy Spirit is to give us joy in hard times. When we are pushed down in the mud, when everything is against us, when the Holy Spirit is alive and fresh and at work in our lives, He can give us joy in the midst of our suffering. He can give us light in the midst of our darkness. He can give us hope when it seems that all around us is despair. We need the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He brings us joy. He brings us joy. Amen. 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 And Paul says, and, 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 you th and I want to tell you something. It's not just for mature believers. Now I understand the theology of suffering. These are brand new Christians, but the Holy Spirit brings them joy in their suffering. So Paul is concerned because severe suffering came at the same time, and then he had to leave them. Let's see what then in chapter 2, verse 14, And then, then, dear brothers, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. All they did was accept the message of Jesus Christ, and it brought persecution from those around, us, around them. Same thing that had happened in other areas as well. And then, let's go a little bit further. 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 and 18. Um, Let's see. So why does Paul want to come back to them? He wants to come back to them because they're a young church and they're undergoing severe persecution. And so Paul says, we were separated from you. We tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you. And I tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. You mean Satan prevented the great Paul from doing something? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. The enemy fights hard for what has been his. Oh, may we fight harder for what is promised to us. A lot of Bible scholars believe that when Paul says Satan prevented us, they believe that it wasn't a failure on Paul's part, but that the bond that was posted by Jason and the other believers, it was a bond that guaranteed they would keep the peace or it was a bond that guaranteed these troublemakers will leave the city and they won't come back. 
And so that's what prevented them. But Paul, being a pastor and he has a father's heart, he's not content with this. Christians are born, but they got to grow up and they've got to be trained and they've got to be strengthened. And so then Paul writes, he says, when we could stand it no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens. We sent Timothy to visit you. He's our brother and God's co-worker. Remember I told you when we were talking about Timothy, this young man, uh, perhaps even in his late teens or his early 20s. He is proven through this and Paul tasks him with a very important task. And he goes, to the, he goes back to the, to the Thessalonian church. And we wanted him, we sent him to strengthen you, to encourage you in your faith, to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you were going through. I am afraid sometimes that brothers and sisters, when our brothers and sisters go through trouble, and when they go through hard times, and when they get discouraged, and when for whatever reason they don't come to church just because they're feeling down, I'm afraid sometimes we tend to point a finger instead of encourage, don't we? We tend to hand on hip. Why aren't they in church? They're <laughs> oh, may the Lord help us to encourage, to strengthen, um, and, 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 and to build up and, and to help. And brothers and sisters, if somebody does that to you, please don't get offended and say, well, I'm doing fine. I'm, 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 I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> receive, receive the encouragement as it is intended. It's intended from love. It's intended from love and concern. I really mean that. Honestly, some of the reasons we don't say anything at times is because we're afraid we'll offend the person, right? So maybe on both sides, a little bit of grace, okay? Maybe on both sides, a little more acceptance and a little more tolerance. And Paul writes, but you know we were destined for such troubles. Even while we were with you, we warned you that troubles would soon come. And they did, as you well know. How many of us, how many churches these days included in the basic discipleship of the church, they would include, now troubles are going to come if you're really going to follow Jesus. No, don't tell them the bad news yet. <laughs> Let's wait till they're a little bit older. <laughs> but I, honestly, that's kind of how we do it these days, right? Paul... That's right. Paul never beat around the bush, did he? He always said, trouble will come um, as you follow the Lord. As, because Paul preached, Paul lived a radical life and he preached a radical gospel. And, that's, and we say radical, but in fact, that's what the gospel was meant to be. And lives were meant to be radically changed and lives radically lived. That's how it is to be. That's how it is to be. And honestly, I think these days sometimes... Our lives as Christians are very, very easy because they're not, we're not living very radically. We're not, we're not living really sold out to God and as God wants us to live. But Paul says, hey, trouble will come. I told you, and it did come. He says, that's why I couldn't bear it any longer. So I sent Timothy to find out, is your faith still strong? I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you and that our work had been useless. Because that sometimes happens, doesn't it? May it not happen to you. May it not happen to me. So let me say something this morning while, before we go any further. If sometime in the future, near or further along, trouble comes your way, look at this. Don't turn away. Don't fall back. Don't give up. And don't compromise. Don't let the devil win the victory in your life. You hang on there, and you hang in, and you keep on going with God. And instead of withdrawing yourself, which is what the enemy will want you to do, reach out some, to some friends who are Christians and who will support you and encourage you and pray with you and pray for you and kick you a little bit if needed to get you back in. Amen? Amen. 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 So. So they, he says, I sent Timothy. We couldn't stand it any longer. What report will Timothy bring? Timothy brings a good report, doesn't he? What is the report? He brings us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and you want to see us as much as we want to see you. You mean the troublemakers Paul and Silas were still remembered with great joy? Oh, yes, they were. And a good report comes.
a good report comes. So I want to ask you in the, la in the few minutes that we have as we close and we turn to this last section this morning, what makes it possible for a young church not fully trained to make it through such hard times when their leaders, Paul and Silas and Timothy, have gone off and it seems like they're sort of on their own. What helps them to stand? What are the foundation stones that are built into their lives that help them to keep going? Because what it is for Thessalonica, it is for us as well. So, let's see. Here are some verses. He says, Here's your first foundation stone. When we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. The word and the message they received came with the convicting, convincing, transforming power of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is true, but the Word of God partners with the Spirit of God and it works in our hearts and our lives to convince, to convict, and to transform. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you ever move on from this church and you go to another church, let it never be a church that preaches the truth but without the convicting, convincing, transforming power of the Holy Spirit that accompanies the Word of God and applies the Word of God to our lives. To our lives. It must be God the Holy Spirit is there to wield the Word of the Spirit in our lives. And Paul says to the Thessalonian church, these young Christians, when the Word of God came to you, you knew it was true because the Holy Spirit was working in power as the Word came forth. How many of us, we've heard the Word of God, or we're reading, the, we're, we're reading God's Word, or a friend, a Christian, speaks something to us, and it's just like an arrow to our hearts, or a burning in our hearts, and we know, God, that's you. That's your Word. That message is from you. Don't ignore it. Don't set it aside. Don't downplay it. It is God's Word coming to you and to me in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the foundation stones for the Thessalonian church. The Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. Then look at 2.13. It says, this is why we constantly thank God. Here's another part of it, okay? Are you ready? Here's the other part. Here's one of the other foundation stones. We constantly thank God because when you received the message about God that you heard from us, you welcomed it. There's another part to it. There's another part to it. You welcomed it not as a human message or mere human ideas, but as it truly is, the message of God, which also continues to work effectively in you believers. What happens, brothers and sisters, when you hear the Word of God, when you read the Word of God through a preaching or a teaching or a sharing in small group or something you hear on the radio or a book or a friend says something to you and it comes with the power of God, what does it find? What reception does the Word of God and the message of God find in your life and in your heart? Do you receive it as the Word of God? Do you hold on to it as precious? Do you say, oh God, thank you. That is your Word for me. I hold on to it. I take it. I bring it into my life. Do you do that? Or do you just kind of say, well, that's good? Or do you say, well, that's your opinion? Brothers and sisters, I believe one of the curses of the 21st century is this spirit and attitude of independence and rejection of anything that sounds or seems authoritative. There is such a spirit of rebellion in the world, in the world. Don't tell me what to do. It doesn't matter what age. In fact, sometimes the younger the age, the more the more rebellious, the more... Uh, and that's not always true. That's not always true. I, 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 but often it is. But I, it's a curse 
in our time. And unfortunately, it is active in the church as well. The word of God comes. We share something with someone and the response is, that's your opinion. Oh, that's what you say. I say, I say something else. The word of God comes to us. We read and we think, well, maybe yes, maybe no. I, I shared something with someone in this church, uh, something that I felt had come from the Lord. And the response was, this was some time ago, I was so discouraged. As your pastor, I was so discouraged because the response was, well, that's what you say. I think something else. I, I, I almost cried with disappointment because I knew it was a word from, the, word from God. It was a message from the Lord that brought what was needed at that time and at that moment. But it was rejected. But it was rejected. Brothers and sisters, the reason the Thessalonians were able to stand was because they received the Word of God into their lives. Let me go a little bit further. In spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. We read that passage already in just a minute. And so we see this the Word of God coming with power and the reception in the hearts of the people. Do you know what? The other side of that is this. There is so much of that attitude, even in churches these days. Many times we, as Christians, with our Christian friends, we don't even say something about when we know we should say something, right? How many of you have uh, self-monitored? You knew, you saw something, you knew it wasn't right but you knew if I say something, they'll get mad at me. They're not going to accept it. They're not going to whatever. And, and so we just monitor. We, we, we edit ourselves because we know what the response will be. I urge you and I encourage you. Pray about it. Let the Holy Spirit control you. Make sure it's from the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit prompts you, you speak to that friend. You say something to that friend. It's the Word of God. And if you pray that there will be a reception in their hearts. And so we see these foundation stones. And I want to close with these two verses right here as we come to a close this morning. Look at what else that's one of the other foundations. And I, I know I'm giving you a lot of scriptures, but we're not reading all of them. This is also from 1 Thessalonians. Uh, sorry, so there was verse 6. In spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. So they welcomed the message. And then it goes into verse 7. As a result, you became an example for the Lord's message rang out from you everywhere. The testimony rang out. Look, look with me at verse 9. For they themselves report what kind of reception we had, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Here's this radical Christian life. How was that possible? Because Thessal Thessalonica was extremely idolatrous. Look at this, and I put these two verses together, and you've already so looked at this, but look with me. So they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and then you look down here. As they received the message about God, they received it as being from God, and this message of God received into their hearts works effectively in you believers. If you and I want radical transformation in our lives, just as it was in the Thessalonians, we must receive the message as it is, the Word of God, as it comes in power. And as we receive it and it finds a place in our hearts and in our lives, our lives will be changed. Our lives will be transformed. Those things in you that you don't like and that you say, Oh, God, I don't want this. Let His Word come into your heart and into your life. Mix it with action in your life. And the Holy Spirit is there. And He will transform your life. And then from you, just as from the, te the Thessalonians, a testimony will ring out. This word ring out. I love this. The message rang out. The idea is of a trumpet. Boop, 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 boop. You know, that woke you up just a little bit as we come to a close this morning, didn't it? That, but that's what it meant. It's, it's like a trumpet call going out. It rings out. And, and that's one of the foundation stones of the Thessalonian believers. So as we come to a close this morning, I encourage you. You know, we read nine or ten verses in Acts. But I encourage you, you go on 
to 1 Thessalonians. This week, this week, go on, read it, and let it encourage you. And what I want to say to you is, the testimony of the Thessalonians, because they, they also showed a lot of love and other things as well, can and should be our testimony as well. What we see of their lives can and should be true in our lives as well. Don't let the rebellious, independent spirit of this age infect you and change you and, and um, influence you. Instead, keep an open heart to the Word of God, however it comes, however it comes. And as, you, as it receives a place in your life, it will work effectively. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's close in prayer this morning. Amen? I'll pray for you. You pray for yourselves. Okay? Amen. Amen. Lord, we come to you this morning. God, we thank you for these young Thessalonian believers. They speak to our hearts this morning that though they were young and though they were facing severe persecution, Lord, they stood firm. And not only did they stand firm, but Lord, their testimony rang out everywhere that their lives were really radically transformed from, uh, from worshiping idols to serving you, the living and the true God. Father, I pray that as we too establish these foundation stones in our Christian lives, that our lives also will be transformed, will be changed, and that from us a testimony will ring out of a great God and a good God who sets us free, who changes our lives, and who sets us on a path to eternity. Oh God, may you be God in our lives. May you be glorified. May you be lifted up. May you be honored and exalted just as you were in the lives of the Thessalonians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.